I'd like you to think about an experience that you've had in the last year that was truly amazing for you. Maybe it was at a restaurant where you had that meal that just hit every one of your taste buds and you had that energetic server that, that met every one of your needs that night. Or maybe it was for the first time in mechanical history that you got a car repair bill back that was actually less than you thought. But not only that, when the mechanic realized that you were going to be late, they drove you to work in their own personal vehicle. They went that extra mile. For me, this is it. Check out this beauty, the shelf I bought from Costco. So I'm not the handiest of people, and I don't really have any tools. So when people go to buy a shelf, they might look at the dimensions or what it's made of, maybe even how it articulates with the wall. I, I didn't care about any of that. It needed to just say two things on the box, which was easy and no tools required. So I got this baby home, I cracked open the box, and the instructions actually looked like the parts that were in there. And within 20 minutes, I had made this thing. It was miraculous. Most times when I put things together, there's not one or two things left over, there's sort of 12 or 13 things in a drawer and somehow the thing is still standing. So this was a miracle for me. But now I want you to think about that experience that you had in the last year and think about what is the one word that you would use to describe that experience? Maybe it was one of these, personalized, magic, astounding, amazing, or miraculous like me. Well, I work in schools, and a couple of years ago as a principal, I started to think, I wonder if when kids leave their math class, they're saying words like this about their experience. Were they saying that it was amazing, inspirational, sick? I, I don't even know what that means, actually, but <laughs> I've heard that that's a good thing. But not just that, what about our parents? What about our parents who come to our websites? What about our parents that, that come for registration and come to the office? Are they saying that it was personalized, it was amazing, it was inspirational? And not just that, our educators as well, our teachers and our principals. As a former high school principal, I feel really bad for some of my staff that had to endure my staff meetings, which was sort of a slow transition to the afterlife. <clears throat> but I can guarantee that they probably weren't using some of these words. And so I started to think about that. And, and what I realized is that in our digital era, it's all about the review. And corporations and companies all over the planet, they want us to become their unpaid advertisers, and they want to make sure that they get that five-star review. Because what we all know is that a good review travels fast, but a bad review travels even faster. So I wanted to do a little bit of research and digging into these companies and products and services that really did get these sorts of reviews. And what I found is that many of them used a model called human-centered design. And in human-centered design, what you do is you really connect deeply with the people that are going to be using your product or experiencing your service. And you get to understand and empathize with them. And then you design the experience through their eyes. And I started to think about this and, and think, well, in schools, we have humans, and we want them to have that five-star experience. So what if we adopted a mindset called learner-centered design, where we put the learner experience at the center of everything that we do? And the learner's not only the students in our classrooms, but it's our educators and our parents and our entire school community. And I believe that if we take this stance and we follow four basic steps, which are to be slow to do things, to ask silly questions, to wear bifocals, and to have a huge appetite, I think together we can change the experience of school. Now, of course, when I showed my wife these, she thought that I was kind of doing one of two things, either describing my mother-in-law or perhaps validating my plans for retirement. But bear with me. Uh, let's see if we can change this experience together. In 1994, Procter & Gamble, the large multinational corporation in the United States, was experiencing a lull in their cleaning division. Nothing was really going on. It wasn't going well. It wasn't going badly. It was just kind of dead. And so they did something interesting. They hired a design firm called Continuum to inject some life into this sort of listless part of their organization. 
Now, Continuum could have went fast. They could have jumped quickly to a solution. They could have sat with the executives behind a closed door and, and you know, proposed some neon-colored cleaning solution or aerodynamic broom handle. But they did something really unique, something I think that we can all learn from. Rather than try and make a solution, they actually went and watched people clean. They went into their houses, they're invited, just want to say that, but they went into their houses and they watched people clean. They talked to them, they listened to them, they tried what they were doing, and they really developed a close connection to those that were experiencing the solution. And as a result of that unique work, they developed a $500 million a year product for Procter & Gamble, something that many of you might have in your household, the Swiffer. And look at how much fun my daughter is having. She, she just didn't want me to take that picture. I, I did anyways. And it's all because they avoided the dreaded solutionitis. And this is something that we get in education quite often. It's when well-meaning people move rapidly from problem to solution without ever considering those that are going to have to be impacted or implement that solution. I can tell you as a principal, I was pretty bad for this as well. Summer would be coming and the kids would start to wear their summer clothing and you'd see people with spaghetti straps and all that sort of stuff. So what would I do? I'd, I'd slap a dress coat on them. And did that change the behavior at all? No, it actually just made kids become pasta experts. So instead of spaghetti straps, it was linguine straps or fettuccine straps. They figured out the way around it like they always would. Why? Because I jumped quickly from problem to solution without ever having them involved in that process, and it's something that we need to change. The second thing that we need to do is we need to ask silly questions. How many people in here have a child under the age of five or have had a child under the age of five? Yeah, lots. So it won't surprise you to know that in a study in 2013 in the United Kingdom, it was found that children can ask as many as 390 questions per day of their moms and dads. And we all know this, moms and dads, don't we? This is why I bought the Google Home, actually. <laughs> and what I realized is, is this wasn't made by engineers. This was made by a couple of moms and dads that said, we need some help with some of these questions. These are pretty hard. But we need to really, in our schools, we need to really encourage these why questions. In 1943, Edwin Land was walking near Santa Fe, New Mexico with his daughter Jennifer. And Jennifer and, his da and her dad were walking around and, and Edwin was doing what any good dad would do. He was taking pictures of his daughter. And his daughter, of course, said to him, Dad, why do we have to wait for the picture? Now, most people who are younger today don't know what we had to endure as older people with pictures, where you sent them away for three weeks to some faraway land, and they came back, half of them had red eyes, and the family photo had everyone's head cut off. She didn't know that, so she asked that question, and as you saw, Edwin, uh, when he thought about that question and thought more about it, he thought, why indeed? And that led to the creation of the instant camera, all because of a silly question. And so in our systems and in our schools, we need to ask and encourage those silly questions. And again, as a teacher and a principal, I was kind of scared of some of these because what if I didn't know the answer? Questions like, why do our classrooms look the way that they do? And you know, it is an interesting one, especially when we know that students learn in cooperative environments where they get to work together, where they get to do something that's meaningful in an authentic environment that actually resembles what they're going to be going into in the real world. Well, as we know, the only real world environment that a classroom tends to represent is another classroom. And we have all these other opportunities outside of us, but we need to ask and encourage those silly questions. Questions like this, why can't school improvement plans be community improvement plans? And you know, it's interesting because I have nearly 15,000 students in my district spread over 40 schools. Imagine if each one of those schools every year worked on just one community problem. 15,000 people a year working on 40 community problems. What would that community look like after a year or five or 10 years? Why can't school improvement plans be community improvement plans? And if the answer is, is that we've always done it this way, 
I think the moment that we hear those words cross our lips, we need to see that as an opportunity to do something different. We need to ask and encourage silly questions. The third thing that we need to do is we need to wear bifocals. How many people here have had an MRI before? Anyone? Yes, a couple. One of the most important things that you have to do in an MRI is you need to stay still. And what are children not very good at? Staying still. And I know this um, because we, we had something sad happen to us a couple of years ago, something that no parent ever wants. Um, our daughter broke her arm. She fell backwards off a couch and put her hands back to break her fall and instead broke her elbow. So I had to take her to the hospital to get x-rays, and let me tell you, it was not a great experience for either of us. We had to sit her there for about 15 minutes and get shot after shot because she couldn't stay still. Who knew how strong a little two-year-old was? But I can't even imagine what it would have been like if she would have had to stay still for a machine like this. But what if we put on those bifocals, those innovative bifocals, and we looked closely at the problem that we had, but then started to look outside and see where we could borrow different ideas from. When you think about this, if we just jump to solutionitis, we could put up a big sign that says, stop wriggling kids and hope that worked. Or we could blur our vision just a little bit and say, it kind of looks like a tunnel. And where do kids like to go in tunnels? For any of us parents that have been stuck in those tubes at a McDonald's play place, we know that kids <laughs> like to go in tunnels. So if we blur our vision and use our bifocals and look outside of our own situation, what can we come up with? What can we come up with that makes kids not have to stay still, but makes them want to stay still because it's part of an exciting adventure for them? All because we can start to look outside and see the best bits that we can bring back inside to our schools. If you look at this picture, we might see just a parking lot filled with cars. Robin Chase, the founder of Zipcar, saw unused capacity. What do we see here? Do we see chairs and desks and the kids that might fill them? Or do we see unused capacity and potential that we need to unleash? Or maybe when we're going to Ikea later today and we wonder how people can go through and for two hours and afterwards only buy napkins, we can look at it, <laughs> we can look at it as Ikea or as schools, we can look at it as a unique way to provide self-guided school tours. What can we learn if we just look at things a little bit differently? And what about our unexpected experts that we have in our schools? We have children, parents, our community, our teachers that have a diversity of experiences. Do we look at a parent that maybe works as a flight attendant at WestJet as a flight attendant? Or do we see them as someone that has to deal with anxiety and people being nervous right before flying? and think about where do we have kids nervous just before they have to take flight, maybe just before an exam. What can we learn from that person that's a little bit different? What about our students that work in high pressure jobs, and yes, they do right after school, where they're having to deal with things coming at them rapidly. What can we learn from them about time management, about resiliency, or even getting things to people in an efficient manner who are really busy, like when our parents come to pick up report cards. How can we empower our students? And what about our First Nations community? What can we learn from them about the power of storytelling, the power of family or sustainability? All these opportunities are there if we just look and we wear those innovative bifocals. And the last thing that we need to do is we need to have a huge appetite for feedback. How many of us have went through, went through this dreadful scenario where we've forgotten our password, you've entered it five times, you've been locked out, and it sends it to some email that you can't remember, and not just that, when you get it back, you have to come up with 12 letters, numbers, upcase, downcase, a Russian Cyrillic, something like that, and you end up putting your password right on your computer anyways. Um, don't we all say the same thing afterwards? Don't we all say... Did this person ever test this solution? Did they ever try it? Did they ever test it with someone like me that was actually going to use it? And this is something that's very important for us in our schools. If we have a new curriculum like we do, we need to test it with the people that are going to experience and implement it, our teachers and our students. If we have a new website that's there to serve our parents or maybe a new parent-teacher format, 
why can't we test it first rather than place an immovable stake in the ground? And as we know, anyone who is over the age of 21 is old to children, so why can't we just ask kids, if we put a snowboard in a math equation, does it engage you any more than it normally would? Test the solutions with those who are having the challenge. One of the traps that we can fall into is we can say that they don't know what they don't know. How can we ask them when they don't really know? How can we ask our parents? They might not know enough about this. But the one thing I do know about every student, every staff member, and every parent is they are an expert on their own learning experience. And so we have to become the ones who discover those experiences for them. One might argue that despite the hard work of so many different people, that the classroom experience hasn't really changed all that much. And I understand that. But I think I can see this a little bit differently now. I see that change is not only an opportunity to make better solutions with people, it's an opportunity to empathize and connect deeply with the people that we serve. That's the real secret sauce. Change is an opportunity to connect to our community. At the start of my conversation today, I asked you to consider that amazing experience outside of schools. Now I'd like you to think about what was that one amazing experience that you had inside of a school with a project that you did, or maybe a teacher that just inspired you in a way that you'll always remember. If you can remember that, then you know that it's possible. You know that it's possible to change the experience of school. And I believe that if we follow these four steps, and we adopt an approach that is learner-centered design, that together we can change the experience of school. Thank you.